It is a pleasure to welcome you to the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is an pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. It is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. Today's lecture is on geohazards, which will be delivered by Professor Sarah Springman and Dr. Barnali Ghosh. Dr. Barnali Ghosh is a technical principal at Mott MacDonald, London, and a Royal Academy visiting professor at Cambridge University. She was recently selected for the Top 50 Women in Engineering Awards, 2020, by WES. She is a chartered civil engineer with specialization in earthquake geotechnical engineering through her PhD at Cambridge University. During her career, she has acted as a seismic designer and reviewer for high-profile projects around the world. Formerly, Honorary Lecturer of University College London, she now teaches earthquake courses across Europe, contributing to professional excellence. Thank you for organizing this uh, lecture because I think it's quite important that while we have wonderful lectures from our academics, you also get to see a perspective from practicing engineers. And so I would like to congratulate the organizing committee for giving us a chance to for us to come and share our experiences. Uh, as I sort of thought about what I was going to talk to you about, uh, I just thought about uh, highlighting on what do we learn from seismic geotechnical failures. I would not call it failure because essentially every failure teaches us something and particularly for, for us as who work as earthquake geotechnical engineers, we always say it's only when things fail we learn about it learn about some new things for this failure. So uh, I'll try and speak for about 30, 35, 40 minutes so that I have to, some time to talk to you and take your questions. Uh, the way I have structured my talk, I'm going to give you a little bit of context about what do I mean by failures. I'm going to talk a bit about earthquake-related geotechnical failure. Uh, I think there are numerous uh, papers that you can read which talks about failures, what happens in earthquakes. So I decided to concentrate on a case study from field and another design example. And then I'll leave you with some summary and discussion and some closure points. Uh, before uh, I start, I wanted to get some key definitions uh, out of the way. So the key definitions are, I, I assume the people who are listening to this talk are mostly people who are interested in seismic. So the most important is a seismic hazard. The seismic hazard is the level of ground motion expected due to seismic activity. And it is measured always in terms of magnitude. Then obviously the next one is vulnerability, seismic vulnerability. So essentially how susceptible is a structure to an earthquake? And risk is a product of seismic hazard and vulnerability. So expected amount of damage due to a specific earthquake. So for example, you can be in a highly seismic zone, maybe California, but if you have designed your structure, including all the uh, seismic, all the seismic parameters, taken care of ductility in your design, have used all the advanced methods of analysis, you may still, your risk may be very low. Whereas you are in, if you have in a low seismic region, but if you have a high vulnerability, then your risk may be very high. So we, need, we do need to understand these concepts about risk and vulnerability. Another thing that comes often is the concept of return periods. Now, return periods has, I'm sure everyone is aware, but what I wanted to highlight from this, in this particular slide is that normally, when we are designing for seismic, we would normally have designed ground motion levels, three ground motion levels. One of them is an occasional, which has an average return period of between 50 to 100 years. The second one, which is called as the rare, has an average return period between 200 to 475 years. And if you are doing a code-based design, in most cases, this is what the, this is the event that you will be catering for. But for very important structures, like for example, say you are designing a nuclear power plant or a dam, you would go for what is called as a very rare event, which would have a return period, much higher return period between 1000 to 2475 year return period. What do these mean? Uh, this 
This uh, image that I've taken from Vision 2000, it's quite popular with structural engineers, everything that for different motions of ground levels, this is what you would expect. Our aim initially as seismic engineers were to prevent total collapse, but slowly the field is moving towards building resilience in your structures, which means that you not only cater for life safety, but you also want to make sure that you have enough resilience in your structures. How we do that is a different matter and there are different ways and options which we can talk uh, when we look at some of the other slides. So this is the, this just sort of forms a context around which seismic design is based on. What return periods are you designing? What kind of performance criteria are you expecting for your structure? So I like this slide because it tells me how do you want your building to behave in an earthquake? I've got two examples. The one which is on the left is from the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. Earthquake, fairly high magnitude earthquake. Nothing happened to the building, everything is fine. So that's a good de detailed designing from structural engineering viewpoint. Whereas the picture on the right, you see what's happened there, typical soft story collapse, the building has, you can see the sheer cracks which have propagated through the structure. And this is the type of failure that we have seen repeatedly in many, many earthquakes that have been occurring. Now I ask you the question, how do you want your foundation or the ground to behave in an earthquake? This picture, which is taken from the Kobe earthquake is a very famous picture. You can see what has happened to the foundations. Is this what you want? Or the other one, which is taken from Mexico City, where the structure is more or less intact, but the foundation is completely collapsed and overturned. So question is, how do we want our ground and foundation to behave? Everybody here should recognize the fact that it is difficult to repair, uh, repair damaged foundations. Therefore, as geotechnical engineers, we often take the view that if a structural collapse has to happen, it should happen in the structure. And some of the codes, like if you're designing to Euro codes, it also uh, sort of propagates this philosophy and the load factor is increased by a, uh, by a factor called sigma, so del which you introduce to the, your equation. But this is not required if you're following some of the American codes, but normally good practice is to increase uh, the load by what is called as an overstrength factor. So it's a question of philosophy. What are you expecting from your foundation? So I hope that gives you some context. If you are a geotechnical engineer, you would see that you only see hazards everywhere after an earthquake. So once you have an earthquake, there is a release of seismic energy that can cause different types of effects. You can have slopes, which Sarah talked about earlier, slopes crumbling. You can have heavy ground accelerations, which would make sure, which would destabilize your buildings. You can have the, what are called as the lateral spreading, liquefaction, all of these are the various geotechnical hazards. And a good seismic geoengineer should be able to recognize these hazards, should be able to design for these hazards. How we do that is going to talk mostly about in the next slides. So remember, I asked, we talked about geotechnical risks. So from where do the geotechnical risks propagate? The geotechnical risks propagate, first of all, understanding and estimating the seismic hazard and uncertainty. We have seismologists who would tell us what is the expected seismic hazard at a particular site, but it is also a reality that, that Predicting an earthquake accurate time still remains a chase, still remains an empty dream. So most people are still trying to think of a hazard value, which is realistic. But there we know many examples where the hazard values either under predicted or not as accurate. So this is a risk arises from uncertainty in predicting the seismic hazard and uncertainty. The second most important geotechnical risk arises from the estimation of ground dynamic properties and ground model. I mean, what exactly is the ground model? How confident are you of your data? I have worked in many parts of the world where 
geotechnical information is really sparse and so people do not have an adequate information about the ground and they make assumptions and sometimes these assumptions do not prove to be correct. The third one is you have an earthquake but how is the ground motion transferring? Is there liquefaction? Is there lateral spreading? So there is a big risk from these. Obviously, when you're designing your foundation, how are you assuming the loading conditions? What sort of material models? I heard somebody ask about, uh, liquid, about models that were used, constitutive models that are used for modeling. All of this will play a big role in understanding and in designing the foundation design. And the, finally, the most important thing, in my opinion, which is the how do you understand dynamic soil structure interaction? Have you accounted for dynamic soil structure interaction in your analysis? And all of these, each of these factors, they contribute to the geotechnical risk and will cause a failure. So if you look at the failures that have occurred due to earthquake, you will see that all of this is more or less related to these factors. So this is what I call as the seismic cycle. The seismic cycle is a very simple concept, but this is what needs to be done in practical terms. First of all, we have to understand what we are designing, which we call as understanding the client's needs. If somebody wants to build a dam in a highly seismic region, clearly the seismic criteria and the seismic effort for doing that design will be much more significant than somebody wanting to do a residential building in a low seismic region. These two have to be recognized. So that is why it is important what we call as to define performance objectives and acceptable risk levels. So how much risk are you willing to take? All of seismic design is based on a certain acceptable risk. For example, if you are designing for a 2475 year return period, then you have a 2% probability of exceedance uh, during the lifetime of the structure. So once you have accepted the risk, you go and look at what is called as advanced design and innovation. So here you look at all your uh, concepts on how you can build up a robust concept. You can have the best of the design, but if your construction is not competent enough, then what would happen with what, is, what we see after every earthquake failures. So here comes the importance of the field performance. So once you've had your uh, had your monitoring and there's an event, then you monitor and review the performance after every earthquake, and then you see and come back and change your design methods if necessary. So this cycle is called as the seismic cycle. This is a business graph actually shows what is the mind of a seismic engineer. Because as seismic engineers, we are working with geotechnical engineers, engineering geologists, and numeric seismic modelers. But somehow, somewhere, a bad project means that we have not closed all the gaps. So there is either no communication, and geotechnical engineering is about linking all these individual aspects and linking the gaps together so that we have a coherent and a safe design. So the controlling mind of a seismic engineer should be the person who should link numerical analysis with geology and past performance of a particular problem that you are trying to solve. This is very, very important. And I think if, if there are students who are listening to me, I would suggest that you do keep this in mind and take it as one of the key messages from this talk today. I work in a global company, Mott McDonald. We work across different sectors in the world, uh, across buildings, communication, power, education. And because it is such a wide sector, seismic is there in each and every aspect of the work. And that is why I get to work in some of the most uh, interesting and challenging seismic projects of the world. So having said that and provided you the context, I thought I would talk a little bit about a field experience. Uh, although the Nepal earthquake is, bit, uh, is happened in 2015, but I think some of the lessons that we learned from that uh, event actually was very useful for us to do further design in Nepal, which we are supporting. So this is the reason why I bring this topic up. Now, this earthquake, if, you're, if you are all aware, as I said, it happened on 25th of April, 2015. Uh, magnitude was a 7.8 magnitude. 
Uh, it was a very shallow earthquake and it killed more than 9,000 people. Uh, but it, the injury was far more. The Western world reacted very strongly to this earthquake, mainly because there was an uh, it's a, there was an avalanche at Mount Everest which killed 19 people. And almost just after the event, many of us saw this uh, video in our phones and in Twitter. The estimated loss from this event was about seven billion. Uh, the more uh, more uh, difficult part of this was it it destroyed centuries of building at UNESCO World Site. Now, Nepal is obviously very popular because of Mount Everest and also uh, the in size, Nepal is probably similar to the state of New York and the country of Greece. And obviously the main 17% of the population in Nepal, they reside in urban communities and mostly Kathmandu being the largest city with a population of just over 1 million. Uh, this earthquake also triggered many landslides at remote sites and perhaps the photograph that you see became one of the pictures which became very very uh, popular this was taken by our team and <clears throat> so as after the earthquake in the uk we have what we call as the if it if it is similar to uh, to what you have in the us as jir and to different and uh, different countries japan has a similar once the if it stands for earthquake engineering field investigation team if you go to the link that i have provided you will see uh, there are different if it reports for major earthquakes the main purpose if it collects a team of uh, geotechnical engineers seismologists structural engineers and uh, social scientists in fact one of the things we did in this mission was uh, was interviewing people about their feelings before and after the earthquake. So this is a very multidisciplinary team. And the purpose of this was mission was to gather data and to evaluate the performance of heritage structures and also to use these missions to teach um, future generation of engineers on what to look out for after you are in a disaster zone. So, now here I have to just uh, I mean, this can become a separate topic on its own, but I just wanted to highlight a few things that uh, we stayed in a hotel. Uh, we, we went to Nepal just about a month after the actual earthquake. So, I mean, before going there, I had expected uh, the media photographs showed that there were a lot of devastation, should be a lot of devastation. So when I went to, when we came out of the airport in Kathmandu, there was really much visible. So we're really very confused by what was going on. What were the pictures that we expected and what we saw was totally different. And so the, one of the reasons for that was this earthquake had a very funny uh, spectra shape and it had a very high uh, ground motion at higher periods. So between five to six seconds, there was a peak. And uh, in Kathmandu, there were not that many tall buildings. So that was one of the reasons why the damage in Kathmandu was not that extensive. So we stayed in this hotel, Annapurna, which is in a sort of the center of the city. And this earthquake uh, impact was not just confined to building collapses. I mean, many geotechnical structures were also suffered. Uh, some of the road embankments were damaged uh, due to differential settlements and lateral spreading of the soil. The so essentially there were two areas which I want to highlight here. If you look at the map, one of them is the Hotel Annapurna and another one is the Balaju Park. So if you look at the Balaju Park area, uh, the devastation or the pictures there kind of show more than what happened in Hotel Annapurna or in the center. So it was interesting to see what was happening here. Now, those of you who know Kathmandu, you should be know that Kathmandu Valley is, uh, is actually, it sits in a valley with very deep deposits and Annapurna is in the center, location of Annapurna is in the center of this valley and uh, Balaju Park, which we're looking is, is currently at the edge of the valley. The basin, as we know, which is called as basin effects can amplify ground motions at low to moderate uh, ground shaking due to weak soil with moderately low shear wave velocities. Uh, during the aftershock, there were some aftershocks. There's evidence that the soil responded non-linearly uh, uh, due to the high amplitude ground motion. So this kind of side effects were known in Kathmandu Valley. 
So what did we do? As a team, we carried this small instrument that you see, which is a micro tremor, uh, micro tremor measuring. So it's a geophysical equipment, but it's a very small portable. So when we were checking at Heathrow Airport, they could, this instrument was given to us by Geomed and uh, in, at Heathrow Airport, we could actually carry this without really getting into any problem with the checking. So what this instrument could do is you trigger, uh, you use, you trigger a impulse and then you can measure the stiffness of the ground. So the whole purpose of trying was to try and understand the dynamic characteristics of the ground. So you can see some pictures on how, but of course it is affected by, uh, by the urban noise. So you have to do these things. We try to do it mostly early in the morning or late in the night when it's quiet so that, you know, and also if you have a man-made surface layers, then these recordings do tend to get affected. So just showing you some simple examples from this. This is uh, for people who do geophysics. This is just a H by V ratio, which shows the impedance contrast here. The, the, <clears throat> The purple colors, darker colors show it's mostly rock, whereas as you go towards the red or the other colors, they show soil or mostly silts in this case. So essentially what we could see was in Hotel Annapurna, the, the hard surface and then you had, a, you had a, the Eurocode soil classification was a class C, whereas for Balaju Park, the classification was a site class E. And if you look at the acceleration, uh, the natural period for these, the Balaju Park, which is noted by the figure BP, had a very high acceleration recorded. Whereas Hotel Annapurna, which is HA, in the curve has a very, very, is lower than that. So, act, act, so this is the, one of the reasons why, the, why you had much more higher damage in Balaju Park compared to Annapurna. Uh, we... This was actually the first time that somebody had some stiffness characteristics. With the recordings from the micro tremor, we had a soil column, effectively what was shown earlier, and we could do some site response analysis for the site using, the, using our knowledge of the area. And what came out was very surprising for us. We found out that if you were doing a code design spectra, so which is, which is just shown by this black line, if you had a code design spectra, black and purple line, you can see what was actually recorded in the site and what we were finding out from our site response is all of the red lines that between the period of four to six seconds, the at higher periods, the code was actually underestimating. Now, this could be because of certain, either it could be due to the basin effects that's happening in a particular in that particular area which we were investigating or there could be some fault directivity effects. But whatever the conclusions from this study, uh, from the site information that we had, we could see that the code spectra in, in Nepal was not really, if there were taller buildings in Nepal, then they would have suffered far more devastation than what was. All of this work is published in a journal paper uh, by Talit Williams et al, a team of us uh, and is also there in the IFIT report. So if you're interested, you can have a look at that later. So the other thing that we looked at was liquefaction. I know that liquefaction was, uh, it was difficult when we went there, it was difficult to see direct evidence of liquefaction, but there were Japanese team out there who conducted, uh, because the soil was silty soil, so not directly under the liquefaction, sort of criteria for sands, but you could see some of liquefaction in, was evident in some of the hydropower schemes and others. So the, a lot of testing was done. And what came out of this liquefaction study was that the liquefaction curve that is used for, for the soils in Nepal is a slightly different curve. So this is, uh, this is also in the open domain. The proposed boundary curve of Kathmandu soil is slightly different from what you would have normally as a typical liquefaction curve. So this type of uh, geotechnical survey can teach us uh, things which we can use in our design practice. So the main observations to summarize from this field trip was that nothing that we saw surprised us because geotechnical failure modes were known from past earthquakes. Uh, Past earthquake, uh, post earthquake damage assessment is essential to learn the good, bad, and ugly. The ugly meaning that where you have got it completely wrong. 
If admission showed that damage is less than expected in the Kathmandu city, ground motion measurements data still not very adequate. And, and in fact, when we went there, we only had ground motion data from one station. Uh, for the, all the other remaining stations, they were not functional or the data was not available. Uh, so the small microtremor measurements that we did have showed that the code spectra can be unconservative for Nepal and we have communicated that uh, to the authorities there. Uh, this also led to some improvements in liquefaction assessment curves for soils in Kathmandu. And this brings us back to the seismic design cycle that I talked about earlier. So essentially, field trips are really, really important. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a practical design example. Uh, I know Sarah talked a lot about slopes, so I picked up this example and talking about slopes because this will this is in line with what she expressed. And to just but we're going to talk about a little bit about seismic design of slopes to bring it back to this. This is a very interesting project where we got involved. Um, if you look at the picture at the bottom, this is what the slopes look like, and I always call it an example of mountain. This was effectively a mountain uh, and the client uh, acquired the site for some investigation for some uh, commercial purposes and uh, found that when they were digging the toe, there were massive vertical displacements almost up to one meter. And uh, obviously that is the point where we were involved in this and the slopes the slopes were not very steep. The slope inclinations were typically between 15 to 20 degrees. Uh, the slope lengths were about 400 meters, so huge areas, the cracks with measurable displacement. But if you had done the slope stability analysis before, uh, you would not expect this slope to fail. Factors of safety were, were more than 1.5, which the code requires. So it became, it became really a very challenging project to get involved in, that why were these slopes, why did the slopes crack? Uh, so on getting involved on looking at very complex uh, geological history, we looked at the desk study and found that the slopes are in a highly seismic region and um, there's a big influence of the tectonics and the structure and the slopes were heavily faulted. And Sarah talked about the hydrogeology was a very, very key aspect that there were water seeping in and the failure that occurred in the time actually occurred in the period where we had some of these um, hydrological key aspects were there. So this project actually, what we found when we went to site, we found that this, uh, there were lots of site investigation, but uh, what the site investigations had missed was that, that although the most of the soil, most of the soils were rocks here, they were mostly tufts and uh, igneous rocks. There was a small shear zone which was actually from fault activation. And this small shear zone was the area where the, so where the slope had slipped. So this is the story of uh, what happens if you miss shear zones in site. So if you're doing a routine design of slopes, when many of you are doing it, most people end up doing the limit equilibrium methods are usually adopted for the definition of factor of safety for routine design. And just a simplistic, if you want to consider an earthquake, you just apply a pseudo-static approach where you just apply a horizontal lateral load and then. But the main, pur main purpose is if you just target factors of safety, in order to get a factor of safety greater than one, you have to reimpose the slopes. And as a purpose of that, this increases the cost of the slope. So what has uh, slope performance in earthquakes taught us? that slopes are in general much more robust. And if you can use the deformation characteristics of the slope to govern the design. So what this tells us is the seismic performance can be acceptable for slopes, even if the factor of safety is less than one, provided you can ensure that the deformations are below acceptable limits. So if you look at the observed seismic displacement in slopes, and I borrow heavily from the work that Professor Ratche, Elena Ratche and uh, Jonathan Bray have done uh, in, in pushing this uh, performance-based design criteria for slopes. But it's quite difficult when, when things have been done in the academic world to bring it to practical field and to convince the clients. So in order to convince our clients that we wanted to 
use a performance-based design approach for, for slopes. We looked at the performance of slopes from past earthquakes and found that in almost all cases, uh, observed displacement in slopes is smaller than what is predicted using most sophisticated methods. And one of the most uh, very well documented is this California Geological Survey document, which kind of puts a limit on this displacement. It says that if the displacement is less than 15 centimeters, then poor performance of the slope is unlikely. Uh, and if you have displacements greater than 100 centimeters, some deformation is likely. And likely for displacement between 15 to 100 centimeters you want. So it kind of puts 100 centimeter as a limit, sort of for high displacements. So determining what your deformation limits were becomes very, very critical. So if you are following uh, the deformation-based approach to analyze slope behavior, you can do it through the empirical methods which by using a program called Slammer. And in Slammer, Slammer, for our particular site, we were in the middle of nowhere. And so we thought, we proposed that we could have a cutoff displacement, which is about a little bit higher, mainly because uh, even if the slope fails, it does not affect any residential properties or anything else. So we increased our threshold property and our threshold accelerations were about 50 centimeters. So we said, the slope displacements, whatever design we do for the slope, the displacements should be less than 50 centimeters. And in order to do this, what we did was a dynamic uh, nonlinear time history analysis of the slope, where we redesigned the remediation for the slope in order to prevent by using the anchors, ground anchors. And I'll show you a video of how this was done if we have time later. But uh, what this nonlinear time history analysis was done by using the software flat. And by this, we could limit the displacements. So what you see here is the displacement status that was covered by using different approaches. So if you look at it in blue, if you followed the empirical methods, and green is if you follow nonlinear, robust, robust uh, finite element methods. And so what we could say was that in all cases, the criteria for displacement was satisfied, but obviously the design robustness was displacement calculations adopted for multiple techniques. So you can start with very simple displacement calculations like new mark type analysis, and then move over to more rigorous calculations. So this project actually, this is in a highly seismic region of the world and uh, was one of the largest ground remediation work that was done by using anchors. So the slope was performance-based design approach was used for the slopes and single bore multiple anchors with 14 strands that are about 50 meters long was split into, split into this bonded lengths were used as remediation. Now, because of uh, what we need to understand, because the site investigation did not understand the problems initially, we, this caused a delay in construction cost program. It had an effect on everything. So really understanding, but by approaching this performance-based approach, we could minimize all of these to a significant effect. So this is an example of how what we learn from fields that slopes in general are much more robust and their deformation limits can be thresholds, can be increased case by case basis we could design a solution. So I hope I've given you an example of how it is being done in the practical field. Of course, there are lots of details which I have not shared with you because of the limitation of time. Now is just a time I want you to relax now and think back. Okay, so these are the failures that's happening after an earthquake. But what about future climate-related disasters? Does it have an effect with seismic? Uh, this is an, a map of the global impact of uh, different climate related, related threats. So you have heat waves, you have droughts. So how does my interest in this grew up when a client asked me this question, uh, do you think you will have more earthquakes because of climate change? And uh, I was completely said, okay, we need to go back and look at this. So I got a research student uh, to come and look at this particular problem. And one of the things we looked at was the global seismic hazard map is actually, 
the regions of the world where you have highest impact of climate change are also mapping with the regions of the world where you have highest uh, seismic intensity, seismic earthquake effects. So there seemed to be a connection. But this is a graph which I have picked up from Munich Ray. What it's, it's very interesting because what it shows here are in Maroon, what you see at the moment are the number of events which are due to geophysical events. So, and then what you see on top are these ones in yellow are because of the climatological events. So what this data is telling us, as you, this is tracking from 1980 to 2018, as you follow this graph, you can see that the impacts due to climate, climatological impacts are more or less constant. You know, they don't, the earthquakes, geophysical events, which confer earthquakes, tsunamis, volcanic activities seem to be constant. Whereas the other effects, which are the meteorological effects and the climate change events, seem to be increasing. So what we can sort of say that the earthquake risk, if you look at the future, does not seem to be uh, increasing. Roughly, you're having the same number of earthquakes every year as you were having before. But the climate risk seems to be increasing. What does it mean for us? What it means for us is that in future, if your water table rises, maybe liquefaction risks may become an issue. So it does have some indirect effect, but we cannot say that because of uh, climate change, we are going to have more earthquakes in the future. I hope this will give some of the, if there are academics in the audience, they would, this will give them an idea. But what we came out with is this uh, resilience diagram, which we are now sort of providing to many clients, where when you have an asset, you look at the climate change hazards as well as the seismic hazards, and look at the interactions between them. So any asset, has to be designed so that it is safe in this uh, surrounding area where you look at the interactions from all of these different hazards. So essentially the as asset was looked at the seismic hazard as well as the climate change hazards. And this is the kind of framework which we are proposing for areas where you have a high threat of climate change effects. So this is a kind of a, uh, pushing the boundaries of knowledge into something which is going to become increasingly uh, important in future. So I've come to, as I said, I did, I wanted to make it more interactive. So my last thoughts are really around the base that effective seismic design is throughout the geotechnical life cycle and we can learn from case histories. But it's not just important to learn from case histories. What is important is how you bring it back to your design. And when you do a seismic robust design, uh, you must use a different methods which can range from very simple methods to very complicated methods. And each approach that is selected should be validated. And I would, my really urgent request to everyone is do not trust softwares blindly. Please have some sensible idea about what the softwares are telling you because I see too many results when people use software without really thinking about what they are putting in their softwares. And obviously now, we have very powerful computers, so we should all try and be digital by default. So if you have uh, robust solvers with very good programs, then try and analyze these problems numerically if possible. An effective foundation uh, design, or let us all try and make sure that we do a very safer design. Uh, thank you for listening to me. I will be happy to take any questions uh, that you may have, or else I can show you my video that for a minute, the video that I was talking about in the slope. So this is just in flak, but it kind of shows the ground anchors. The blue are the ground anchors. So if I just do it a little faster, move. So we're looking at the maximum shear strains. And I talked about this shear surface, which you will see. So we're tracking it in the earthquake time. So you can see some shear strains are developing. And this is the failure surface, actually, where you can see the how the shear strains are developing along the toe of the slope. Thank you. And I'm happy to take any questions. I see there are some questions here and I think I'm in time. Thanks for Nali for that interesting presentation. I'm sure a lot of people uh, would have learned a lot. And there are some questions, of course. Uh, let's take these two questions and these two uh, look similar to me, at least in some aspect. Uh, the first one comes from, uh, Alexander from Cameroon. 
and he says that according to him the main issue in geotechnic domain is the input data so do you think that with the euro code 7 or 8 in couple of years geotechnic engineers should be able to save structures than life um, there is another question which is in similar line so it makes sense to take them together uh, so this one comes from from Gwyn and he says that when you use a software, for example, FLAC or Plaxis, you need a time history signal. So whatever signal you get, do you modify it somehow to satisfy the Euro code 8? Yeah, there are two different questions. Thank you, very interesting question. I would agree with what you said, the geotechnic domain input data is really, really a key thing. And uh, although the, I mean, I have seen projects in some parts of the world where they were designing uh, a sort of a dam, a very high dam of about 150 meter high dam with very little uh, geotechnical information. So that's quite dangerous. So I think uh, I, I think it was quite um, with the Eurocode, if you do Eurocode 7, Eurocode 8, uh, the way if the site investigation is done according to the specifications and the way the minimum site investigation that is good, but having good site investigation design data does not mean good design. If you remember this slide, having, if you look at this ground investigation, they just form a part of that. But then that has to be linked to the design scenarios, analysis methods. How do you understand the geology and the hydrogeology? And how do you do the parameter selection? So it is not an isolated, just having good site investigation. You need good engineering geologists who can understand and interpret the data for you. And for numerical modelers to work from, to work from the, to understand what they are modeling and also to look at well-instrumented, fully scaled uh, structures, you know, look at data, learn from case histories, learn from actual measurements. So both of them are important. You would have to, there are codes uh, do specify that you, if you have, because we do not have enough time histories, recorded time histories, you would normally do something like a RSP match where you would use a spectrally modified time histories. Uh, if you follow the new American ASC 716, actually it requires 11 time histories. So it's, uh, it's 11 time histories that has to be used. Whereas in Eurocode, it's six time histories. Different codes have different requirements. But there are very, very strict for the work that we do for nuclear industry or for dams we definitely modify the time histories and use spectrally matched time histories. Um, okay, let's take this next question, um, which comes from Boni as a geotechnical engineer from Indonesia. He says that how do you as a practitioner cope with the complex local site effect? Uh, for example, when you have a basin effect or a topography effect without the need to perform a complex numerical modeling. Yes, that's a very good question. And it's uh, the first poll, and that is one of the things I said, we have to start with simple, uh, some simple, I am one of the, uh, I do not propagate numerical modeling as a, just as a first port of call. So I think there is a lot of, if you look at some case histories, look at published data, do your research, a good basic desk study should tell you what is expected, what is happening in similar locations, maybe not in Indonesia, but in other parts of the world, what is happening, look at the research. And then once you have a fair idea, then only if, if you're following some, for example, Eurocode has gives some slope, these basin effects, some of the factors in the basin effects. And there is a lot of work which has been done in Italy uh, for this. So follow all of these examples and as a starting point, look at these complex effects. And if it becomes clear that your situation, it's always about impact. What will be the impact of failure in your particular site? if you've got it wrong. If it is something which is going to cause life safety, then obviously you have to go into numerical modeling, but not as a first port of call straight away. Um, the next one comes from Kausal, and you mentioned an earthquake study that you undertaken at Nepal. So Kausal says that in, um, in the slope displacement, when you are taking the new mark chart, you are telling that, okay, greater than 15 cm is what is the standard or something, or does it need some amount of calibration work? What does your experience tell uh, while working with the displacement estimates and seismic landslide failures? Yeah, it is also, you have to look at the impact. So for example, we went with 50 centimeters because we were, we were not in an in a area which is going to be affected. We were in a remote mountain community. But whereas in Nepal, 
uh, one of the things in Nepal is most codes tell us not to build on slopes. But in Nepal, I believe about more than 60% of the area is in slopes. So it's no way you can say that you're not going to build there. Yeah. So there has to be yeah. some cal calibration and the number can be reduced for your particular site, looking at the effect of what is the impact. It's always the impact, so there's no blanket number. And this is where most codes are failing because they do not, they tell us to go for performance-based design, but they do not give us an idea on what are these numbers, what are the limits. They say your foundation can slide uh, for the remote, for the, uh, for the most accurate event, but how much will it slide? It doesn't give us, many codes do not give you an idea. So this is something which comes from experience, looking at other projects and, and also from practitioners like us sharing our knowledge with the wider audience. Um, okay, this one again comes from a practicing engineer uh, where he says that when he's doing a structural design analysis, they do include the seismic loads and their main mitigation always relies on iron reinforcement. So is there any elastic geotechnical material that can be used in place of this iron reinforcement? Uh, this is, uh, I mean, this is an interesting question. Elastic geotechnical material. Okay, there are lots of... Uh, one of the things is in, in terms of geotechnical material, say, for example, you have a site where you have some liquefaction problem, then obviously you would like to do, you can, there are many ground improvement methods which you can use a deep cement mixing or, you know, you can use uh, stone columns. So it's not, it depends on uh, whether I am surprised that you're saying that uh, reinforcement is good, but reinforcement will not help if you have a problem of lateral spreading, if you have a problem of liquefaction then you have to sort out your ground first. So reinforcement will not really help it. Which reinforcement will provide that adequate ductility, but provided your ground is stable and behaving well in a seismic event. Um, so Mahesh would uh, like to say that the pseudo-static approach is a conventional method. Now there are pseudo-dynamic and modified pseudo-dynamic methods that are available. Uh, did you attempt in any of your studies to employ these methods? Correct. Uh, thank you, Mahesh, for your question. Yes, you're right. Uh, so obviously we started off with the pseudo-static and then we did the pseudo-dynamic methods. And again, in some projects, it might be just useful to just end up in the pseudo-dynamic and just the empirical methods that we, should, we selected. Whereas in some projects, it might where you're challenged and where the client wants you to know exactly the dis displacements that you are, so you would have to do but I, I think the softwares, like uh, there are many softwares now which, uh, which allow you to do the pseudo-dynamic methods as well. So we do use them as a requirement. Let's take the next question, which comes from David uh, from Wits University in South Africa. He says that what could be the possible reason why liquefaction potential measured were not on target? Where potential measured were not on target. So I don't know which, what you are referring to, but essentially, it could be many, many, many reasons. It's the soil characteristics. It could be the geological history. Uh, and also to be uh, the liquefaction, even now what we try and evaluate liquefaction is mainly based on very clean sands with some modifications done for other type. But what we found in a project that we were working in Dhaka, where we have very much silty sands, uh, which is quite difficult. If you look at the soil characteristics, it's quite difficult. If you touch the soil by hand, it's difficult to say whether it is sand or clay or silt because it's all so intermixed together. And in these kinds of soils, it's uh, these curves, using these curves to, uh, using these curves uh, for liquefaction assessment may not uh, really be the right procedure. You have to do much more advanced laboratory testing, cyclic triaction testing to get an in situ Determination. Similarly, for carbonate sands, which are found in a lot in New Zealand as well as in other parts of the Middle East, you have to do a little bit more in these kinds of soil. 